Welcome back to the Agentic School Manifesto. This is Chapter 9, How the Science of Reading Will Fail, again. Let's explore a specific instance of how the dominant concepts about reading instruction have suppressed other concepts to the detriment of kindergarten to third grade children in the USA. The failure of the $1 billion a year Reading First program is a cautionary tale warning us about the hazards of the exclusion delusion. Can the merely implied definition of a word in the minds of policymakers and their agents of implementation make any practical, real world difference? When the federal government fails to produce an intended result after throwing approximately $6 billion into the use of evidence based strategies, change the behaviors of teachers and their kindergarten through third grade students in almost 6,000 schools. An implicit conception of education did make a difference. This is another example of how the hidden curriculum works. Those who wield that magnitude of power within the education system need to have the most accurate conception of education possible, or they will waste not only more money, but crucial opportunities to educate the nation's children. Their failure to adjust will do more damage to our nation than any of our enemies ever could. Definitions that contribute to or that can prevent these wastes are worthy of sustained and critical attention. When the role of motivation in learning is properly understood, it leads to a different conception of education. The concept I proposed in Chapter 5 as a substitute for the delivery concept, is that learners grow mental maps. It follows from this new concept that policy makers would use different priorities for their legislative efforts. The Reading First Initiative, the flagship program of the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, NCOB, neglected motivation as a key component in the process of learning to read. That neglect was because the idea of delivering units of content was the guiding conception of teaching reading in the minds of those who conceived of and implemented the law. It is a conception that neglects to account for other truths about teaching and therefore misleads policymakers into false notions of what will work to improve schools. Policymakers cannot be expected to become educational experts. So, scientifically respectable guidance is crucial to their ability to create effective policy. The most common misconception of teaching is based on assuming that the learner is a relatively simple receptacle for knowledge, skills, and information. It also implies that the central actor in the drama of schooling is a teacher who delivers all the necessary units of content into the learner's head. This is the content delivery conception. Paolo Freire used the term banking in his widely acclaimed 1972 book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Other scholars and critics have used other terms that share the same basic core idea that something is transferred from one person to another. There is a skeletal core within any concept of education. At the most basic level of analysis, being educated means being able to perceive accurately, think clearly, and act effectively on self-selected goals and aspirations. But turning this minimal concept into systemic guidance for reliably producing people with those capabilities requires much more than the bare bones. What is it that needs to happen throughout the process of a person making the transition from being ignorant to being educated? The content delivery misconception answers the question of what should happen by suggesting that every learner should be subjected to the manipulations of a knowledgeable, well-informed, and skillful teacher. Under this conception of teaching, schooling is supposed to be about enabling teachers to maximize their ability to deliver units of content into the heads of students. The image does not inform us about the context in which the learner operates, except that there is a teacher. It is also uninformative about the necessary qualities of that teacher. Those ambiguous features are imaginatively filled in by the non-conscious intuitions, ideologies, and or political commitments of each person as they think about the school system. Learning is the internal process through which an education is attained. 
Therefore, conceiving of it correctly within the field of education is crucial to sustained success. Schooling is a set of systems in which the processes of learning and teaching are institutionalized in order to ensure that our complex globalized society has an adequate supply of educated people. Given this view, the problem we have is that the dominant misconception of teaching that shapes legislation and other forms of education policy is contradicted by both scientific evidence and over a hundred years of critical reflection about the natures of learning, teaching, and schooling by practitioners and philosophers. There are other conceptions, as noted in Chapter 8, but they have yet to be accepted as equally true ideas that must be incorporated into a properly integrated scientific model of education. In Chapter 5, a combination of conceptions was used to generate the learning tree visual model of an important aspect of the educational process. Yet another problem with the content delivery misconception is that the image provides no place to meaningfully integrate what psychological scientists have discovered about the foundational role that motivation plays in the subsequent engagement in the learning process and how the quality of that engagement significantly determines educational outcomes. Self-determination theory researchers Early, Rog, and DC emphasize the importance of motivation and engagement in this passage. Quote, Engagement is a prerequisite for school success. It is manifested as effort and persistence and allows students to profit from challenging curricula. Many studies published over the past 40 years have confirmed that students who are high in intrinsic motivation are more engaged in learning that is deeper and more conceptual and perform better on heuristic as opposed to algorithmic tasks. There is also evidence that when students have fully internalized the regulation for learning, they tend to be more engaged in learning and to perform better than when learning is controlled by external contingencies." End quote. Taking scientific and practical insights into learning seriously, growing mental maps is proposed as a better way of thinking about the learning process. Further, a better guiding image for enabling policymakers to improve the education system is a learning tree with roots that consist of primary human needs, a trunk that incorporates motivation, branches that display a pattern of engagement, and an environment that suggests how the inputs of culture and society also influence learning outcomes. Illustrated in Chapter 5 and in Appendix 3. Hindsight is 2020, as the saying goes. So, out of respect to policy makers, the nature of policy making as a human task will be explored in order to make a case against their culpability in this education policy failure. Federal policy makers in the USA are in leadership positions that are of great importance because they control budgets dealing with a magnitude of money that requires the use of words like trillion and billion. There is a common notion in Western society that humans, especially well-respected and powerful ones, are normally rational in the sense that they can take in unbiased factual information, weigh the merits of each piece of information from some value-neutral objective perspective, and then arrive at a carefully reasoned and logically coherent decision about how to proceed. There is ample evidence that this form of rationality does not exist. If humans were rational in this naive sense, they would act like the TV characters Data or Spock from Star Trek. They would have immediately and automatically calculated a logical course of action based solely on the definitions and other text in the reading first law. The fact that the term motivation was incorporated anywhere in the definition, coupled with the imperative declaration that all elements must be present, should have led a truly rational decision maker to incorporate into their implementation plans some allocations in support of motivation. That is not what happened. And that is also not happening within the current public discourse about the science of reading. Policy makers are typically people with complex interests in complex situations, and as human beings they have a whole suite of non-conscious mechanisms that guide their thinking and acting in ways that they do not normally comprehend. As a consequence, they are extremely busy people with complex demands made upon their limited cognitive resources. The limitations upon their cognitive resources means they are not inherently rational decision makers. This limitation is not unique to people who are busy or powerful. 
it is universal to humans. Thus, none of us are rational in this naive way. We all need some forms of organizational and societal support to achieve rationality. At their best, powerful policy makers build robust organizational systems that they must trust to process information for them. Congressional authorization of the National Reading Panel, NRP, which consisted of experts in research on reading, but notably lacked any practicing teachers of reading, is one of those systems. Then, after those experts made their report, the policy makers relied on another set of organizational systems in which they may or may not have participated to compose a bill based on that report. Both experts and policy composers are also humans with the same cognitive limitations as policy makers, but with different sets of interests and situations making claims on their cognitive resources. At each stage of the game, there were opportunities for the definition of education to non-consciously influence the ultimate outcome. From investigation of the policy challenge getting young children to learn to read, to composing an expert's report, NRP and Task Force on Reading 2000, to composing a bill based on the report, to negotiating the detailed terms of a law that can actually get passed, NCLB with the Reading First Initiative, and finally, to deciding what aspects of the law will receive how much of the budgeted allocation implementation decision. Up until the moment when the law is passed, at each phase of the process, there is an irresistible demand upon the people involved to simplify what they consumed as input in the process of producing the required output. At the later stages of this process, there also arises a complicated political calculus of addressing the interests and concerns of different constituents or stakeholders. Conceptual metaphors embedded in word choices guided the simplifications at each stage of the lawmaking process. Those concepts were codified in the final law, implicitly at least. If the law was consistently shaped by a similar conception of education at each stage, then those charged with implementing the law would have had that conception in mind, if only implicitly, when they made decisions about how to allocate resources. The reports, the law, and the implementation of the law appear to have favored the content delivery metaphor for teaching, even if isolated examples of inconsistent wording or conceptions exist. See Appendix 2 for more details of my analysis of the various documents mentioned. Despite the law explicitly stating a requirement that all six of the components of reading must be included in order to achieve success, the implementers of the law clearly ignored the sixth item, dealing with motivation, in the definition, and allocated funding according to the less comprehensive five-part definition of reading instruction instead. The reporting and analysis afterwards showed little or no concern for the role that motivation and engagement could have played. This seems like a good reason to be skeptical of the power of a definition. In this case, an important feature of an explicit definition within the law was ignored. So why should we expect that any proposed definition can produce a different result? This is where the assumption of human rationality can mislead us. The naive assumption of rationality suggests that the merest mention of motivation should have been sufficient to activate the logical entailments and practical implications for those who were responsible for making decisions about implementation. The program managers were expected to act like Data or Spock. The fact that the term motivation was incorporated anywhere in the definition, coupled with the imperative declaration that all elements must be present, should have led a truly rational decision maker to incorporate into their plans some allocations in support of motivation. Notice that the TV characters with the capability of being this precisely logical are not humans. That is because even Hollywood writers know that this is not how human minds work. The rationality of minds that vary significant cognitive load have severe limitations when grappling with the responsibility of managing the expectations of a variety of constituents. Here's how Senator Al Franken described his cognitive load in his 2017 book, Giant of the Senate. Quote, 
The late political scientist James Q. Wilson described it this way. Once politics was about only a few things. Today is about nearly everything. No issue is so obscure or frankly boring that someone can't muster a high-pressure campaign to get you to vote one way or the other on it. This means you're constantly deluged with information from lobbyists, from public interest groups, and from the people you represent. Congress receives some 300 million emails a year, so there are a lot more issues to keep track of, and there are a lot more considerations determining how you vote on these issues. And you're under constant pressure to do not just the right thing, but the politically smart thing. And also, everything you say and do is covered in a real time by 24-7 press corps, and you have less time in the day to talk to your colleagues or do research or just sit and think for a friggin' second. End quote. However, we can be optimistic about the prospects for a good definition to lead to effective policy if we take seriously the findings of the cognitive sciences that revealed those limitations on rationality in the first place. We have to take into account the humanity of the people involved in this situation. There was a definition that acted powerfully. It was the conceptual metaphor of teaching as a form of delivery that was already wired into the brains of the people working on the law and its implementation. Let's use the airline navigation analogy from chapter 3 to understand what is going on here. Imagine that there are accident investigators trying to understand the relative effects of various factors on my fantasy airplane's course. If they only examine the obvious factors, they are not going to appreciate the magnitude of error that subtle factors can introduce. The obvious effects of the rudder, the ailerons, the engines, and perhaps other features of the airplane would dominate their focus. The magnitude of effects produced by those features would have been much greater than a one-degree navigational error. When they get to thinking about the pilots, they would focus on their behavior and conscious thoughts. They're not likely to consider that the pilots may have been unconsciously affected by the language that was being spoken in the cockpit, the organizational culture and climate, or the implicit effects of policies. The scientists who study reading in the early grades are making correct observations, and they rightly conclude that motivation has a small effect in those early years. What they are failing to account for are the subtle but cumulative effects of the demotivation and disengagement that skills-oriented instruction can have. Demotivation is like that one-degree error exacerbated by the wind and weather over 12,000 miles. The end result can be disastrous, even if the scientists who dismiss motivation as a minor factor are patting themselves on the back for telling the truth. What they are saying is likely true, but incomplete. They should reconsider their self-congratulations in light of the harms their half-truths are causing to untold numbers of children. In an ideal situation, the deliverable skills for reading would eventually be included within a plan based on the growing mental map's conception, but not until further down the line, after motivations and goals have been aligned to make sure the learner recognizes the value of making that investment in the otherwise dull details. As George Lakoff pointed out while explaining the pernicious influence of mechanistic metaphors for learning, quote, individuals are not machines in which a specific input will always lead to a specific output or outcome. Emotions and empathy must be considered in order to truly create change. Rather, children's emotions and other non-rational processes that affect their learning, such as motivation, must be taken into consideration in policy. Without considering these factors, it is likely that educational policy will continue to become more focused on test scores, which has been shown to have largely negative consequences for children and adolescents. End quote. The new wave of enthusiasm for the science of reading is doomed to repeat the failure of reading first, unless the sixth element of the definition of reading is taken seriously. Motivation is critically important to learning and bureaucrats run the risk of inadvertently enacting harmful policies if they continue to ignore that fact. Fortunately, the emotions and other non-rational processes that Lakoff mentions can be taken into account. 
there is even a means to standardize them, as I pointed out in Chapter 7, though that type of standardization will look a lot different from the academic standardization that currently dominates school systems worldwide. Unless we heed Lakoff's warning, the so-called science of reading will fall victim to the exact same mistake. The conception of education in the legislators' minds, under the influence of the exclusion delusion, made their strategy of focusing on delivering decoding skills seem sensible, even though it contributed to the ultimate failure of the program. They got exactly the kind of compliance behavior they intended the $6 billion to buy, more time devoted to decoding, and more measured possession of the skill. But the slightly deeper learning that was the true goal, reading comprehension, did not consistently follow from that compliance. Documents related to the program revealed that responsibility for cultivating motivation was missing from the law, despite warnings, and that error contributed to its failure. The content delivery conception of teaching appears to have been the guiding principle behind the implementation of the Reading First initiative. The evidence-based Reading First program was, according to a variety of reports, implemented with a primary focus on getting teachers to deliver more units of decoding skills in order to produce better reading comprehension. After multiple years of implementation, a large-scale review of the efficacy of the program was issued in 2008. It showed that while teachers devoted more time to teaching decoding skills and that the children possessed more of them, thus fulfilling the mandate to deliver, there was not a significant increase in reading comprehension a slightly deeper level of learning that was the intended outcome. There are differing opinions about how much of a bust this investment was, but in the face of that report, the funding for the program was eliminated as soon as a new presidential administration took over. Appendix 2 presents my analysis of the series of documents cited above that are relevant to Reading First and its controversies. My primary lens was how motivation and engagement figured into those documents. Those analyses were the primary basis for the following arguments. The naive understanding of teaching as content delivery relies on the metaphor that knowledge consists of some kind of discrete units that are transferred from one person to another. The conceptual structure suggests that instruction may be inherently necessary for learning to occur since the units of knowledge must originate somewhere outside the learner and be conveyed to them by someone. Noting the definitions of reading versus reading instruction, and then considering the consistency of the reported implementation priorities, it appears that the primary concern of reading first was with how to provide reading instruction, not on creating optimal conditions for learning to read. This emphasis on teaching instead of learning is the consequence of the delivery concept and does not reflect the understanding of learning held by most scientists and accomplished educational practitioners. Most scientists who study learning and experienced skillful teachers understand that motivation is crucial to the learning process. This understanding was briefly expressed in the minority report statement in the National Reading Panel report that laments the assumption that extrinsic motivation is adequate, and then points out that the cultivation of intrinsic motivation to read would be more appropriate. Motivation occurs across a spectrum from the lack of motivation, called a motivation, through four degrees of regulation that collectively comprise extrinsic motivation, to the other extreme of intrinsic motivation, as enumerated previously in Chapter 3. In the literature of self-determination theory, we do not use the oversimplified intrinsic-extrinsic dichotomy anymore. We refer to motivations that are controlled versus autonomous, with the division occurring in the middle of the six items within the spectrum. The state of mind that follows from these different forms of motivation has important consequences for learning. The controlled end is the least optimal, while the autonomous end is the most optimal. As the author of the Minority Report was pointing out, using an oversimplified terminology that is being abandoned. In order to be effective, 
an education system must have a systematic way of helping learners and teachers at the heart of the system to have appropriate states of mind. In order to exhibit the core capabilities of being educated, perceiving accurately, thinking clearly, and act effectively, independent of the context in which they find themselves situated, the learner must have the ability to alter their own state of mind. The system must produce a method of cultivating the learner's abilities to manage their own states of mind. The neglect of motivation in the Reading First Initiative means that this issue was not addressed by its authors. The inclusion of motivation in the law was merely a few words within the context of a far greater mass of words. According to the various reports and accounts related to Reading First that were reviewed, the definition that appears to have been operative was the five-part definition of reading instruction, not the six-part definition of reading stated in the law. There is no way that busy people processing vast amounts of information could instantly figure out how to reorganize all of their concepts based merely on those provided definitions. There is no reason to expect that anyone involved in the process of creating or interpreting the Reading First initiative would understand the full implications of the stated imperative that requires all six items of the reading definition to be present, and that the sixth part in particular had crucial implications for effective implementation. Most of the text in the law and the coverage of it focused on reading instruction as a set of five deliverable skills. The internal phenomena of motivation doesn't fit within the content delivery image of education. So there is no way that a heavily loaded mind can maintain interest in it, let alone champion in the face of five other more concrete aspects of reading instruction that more easily fit their image. That pattern demonstrates one more way that the hidden curriculum works. There did not appear to be any serious consideration of the possibility that learning to read could be conceived of in any other way. There was no way for that definition of reading to have been given the importance it should, in retrospect, have had in relation to the other definition of reading instruction. Given the subsequent decisions that were made, the imperative to ensure the presence of the sixth component of the definition was clearly ignored. It is therefore no surprise that there was also almost no mention of motivation in any of the subsequent coverage of the law and its controversies. If the implementation of the Reading First program had been based on the growing mental maps idea of education, then there would have been no reason to make deliverable skills the exclusive focus. From the growing mental maps perspective, every child already has existing mental maps of their world which guide their behavior. The central challenge is to enable them to revise their maps to better achieve their goals and ensure that their goals are appropriate for their circumstances. The maps of kindergartners through third graders may or may not have a place for reading. If they do not have a place in their mind maps for reading, then the first task is to help them understand what reading is and why it is valuable to the people who practice it. To grow their map to include reading as something important in the world. Rafe Esquith, the 25-year veteran elementary school teacher who wrote the New York Times best-selling book, Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire, put the issue this way on page 32. Quote, Schools have lost sight of why we read. The objectives always focus on fluency, comprehension, and other necessary but deadly dull goals. I've never seen district reading objectives in which the words joy, passion, or excitement top the list. I think they should. These are the reasons why readers read, and we've lost sight of this fact. End quote. Once there is a place for reading on their maps, then the children may also need help seeing themselves as one of those people who want to be there by valuing that activity enough to practice it regularly. As international education scholar Yong Zhao, who studied early reading program, testified before the Oregon Senate, a good reading score that causes your child to hate reading forever might not be worth it. Focused efforts to cultivate children's skillfulness with the mechanics of the process will be called for 
only after they have grown reading into their mental maps of the world and their maps of themselves. In a scholarly review of the research, most of which was completed after the National Reading Panel noted a lack of studies addressing this topic, Guthrie, Wigfield, and Yu presented a model that reflects this conception of motivation to read preceding the development of competence in reading skills. Their model is further supported by the more general theoretical model of motivation, self-determination theory, which has robust empirical support. This confluence of a general theory of motivation and the specific role motivation plays in learning to read suggests that ignoring motivation in education policy was and remains an unwise course of action. The valuing of the various components of reading success would have been different under a different cognitive metaphor for the education process. If the people allocating resources for implementation of reading first had had the growing mental maps concept available, they would have had to make a choice between which understandings of learning and teaching to use, since the actions that follow from each are fundamentally different. The following quote was reported in Education Week. Richard Long, the International Reading Association's Government Affairs Director, said, The emphasis in most reading first classrooms was only on some of the five critical elements. As important as working on specific skills is, you can't just do that and assume the other skills will emerge by themselves. Notice that this presumed expert on reading and reading policy says five, not six, critical elements. His conception of critical elements does not appear to include any non-skills, such as motivation. A sarcastic motivation psychologist might mock his statement by saying, as important as working on skills is, you can't just do that and assume that motivation and engagement would emerge by themselves. But this mockery would be unfair because it relies on inside knowledge of SDT, which is a narrow technical area that is not well known even within the broader scientific enterprise of psychology, let alone the education sector. The neglect of student and teacher motivation will hamper the learning process, no matter how thoroughly the instructional content is delivered. This concludes the ninth episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention. One final thing for those of you who have joined Deeper Learning Advocates. I am personally available to answer your questions and discuss the contents of this book with you. This opportunity will not last forever, so take advantage while you can. My email is dawn at holisticequity.org. My preference would be to talk over Zoom, but phone or email can work too. Enjoy! <laughs>